of Keith Lattimore and the work he will be doing as the first director of Ramsey County's Housing Stability Department. Let us pray for tremendous success as he begins his collaborative work with partners and agencies to provide direct services and support for people experiencing homelessness and housing stability. Hear also our prayers today for all men and women, boys and girls who are homeless this day, for those sleeping under bridges, on park benches, in doorways, or bus stations. For those who can only find shelter for the night but must wander in the daytime. For families who are broken because they cannot afford to pay the rent. For those who have no relatives or friends who can take them in. For those who have no place to keep possessions that remind them of who they are. For those who are afraid and hopeless. For those who have been let down by our social safety net. For all these people, we pray that you will provide shelter, security, and hope. We pray that those of us with warm houses not be lulled into complacency and forgetfulness. Dear Lord, help us to see your face in the eyes of every homeless person we meet, so that we may be empowered through word and deed and through all the means we have to bring justice and peace to those who are homeless. Amen. Right there. Nice. Very powerful, Julie. Thank you. And now I'll invite Lauren to come on up. We have some much awaited, much excited photos from the Uganda project. With projects like this, it's always best if you can actually see what's going on. So that's the goal today is to have that happen. And Kathy has the photos on the computer and I'm sure she will have them up in just a minute. Mm 
Can you start at the other end, Kathy? Here we go. Okay, here are the tools. This is where we start with. Uh, this is uh, commonly referred to as the uh, Ugandan backhoe. And, and this is what they use to dig a trench three feet deep for 9.2 kilometers to get water from point A to point B. That's it. Go the next slide. This is prior to us getting the water in. These are people that are lined up at the borehole called the well. And what they're doing is waiting in line to get water out of the well and people line up and they put all their jerry cans uh, in a row so they know who's in line where. And then once they get them filled up, they carry them about 2.5 kilometers back to their home so they have drinkable water. Next slide. And sometimes the well runs dry. So they have to wait there multiple hours to let the water seep through the ground and fill into the well so they can continue to pump and put water into their jerry cans. Next. And it's not only people that are out looking for water, it's also cattle. Next. And so this is what David arranged for. He talked with the uh, NWSC, uh, National Water and Sewerage Corporation, and he talked them out of uh, two inch piping. And it turned out they ran out of the two inch, so they had to supply him with the three inch piping. And so this is a three inch piping, comes in 100 meter lengths. And next photo. And this is where they're taking those 100 meter lengths and laying them out along the road, and they're digging the trenches along the road to put them into. Next. Here is digging the trench. You can see with their, uh, with their Ugandan backhoe, it's uh, in action there. And next. And this shows you how deep it is. No, that guy is not a midget. He's a regular sized man. And so they dig it that deep. Next. <clears throat> the workers are working about 10 hours a day. They work 10 hours a day and they came and they didn't bring food with them. They didn't have water with them. He called me up and he said, Lauren, what do we do? I said, you feed them and you make sure they have plenty of water to drink and you just take care of it. I will, I will send you the money, what's it gonna take? And so uh, he did his part and I did my part and we get everybody fed every day that they're working. Yes. Can we be clear how uh, when you said you did your part, uh, that that might come out of your pocket? Uh, yes, it wasn't in the grant, so I just know that the people had to be taken care of. Uh, I had experience with that when I was working with, with Seth at the project in Kittera. And I just knew that that is the standard in Uganda, and so we do it. Thank you. Uh, next. And here is David, uh, he's the guy who's representing us in Uganda, and he's lifting a great big blue tube there. That's a reinforcing tube. Whenever they go under a, a piece of ground that's gonna have a bunch of weight on it, for example, a road or a railroad track or something, then they lay this and run the water tube through that. It protects the water tube so it doesn't get crushed and stop the flow of water. Next. And this is going underneath a rail line. And so he's, uh, he's uh, got the uh, blue tube in place and then they're gonna put the water tube inside of it to protect it and then bury it under about three feet of ground. Next. This is the machine that they have to bring in and use every hundred meters to put the sections of pipe together. And so they just keep moving this down the line and they have some technician that knows how to do it. And so they just keep putting these 100 meter sections together and uh, nine kilometers, that sounds to me a lot like uh, 90 sections. So a lot of work involved with that. Next. And at the end of that, everybody gets fed again. Next. 
And finally, we're getting kind of close to the tail end. And they thought, well, I think we'd better do two things. Number one, let's flush out any kind of impurities that happen to be in the piping from all the work and the open ends of it. And secondly, let's just double check to make sure that everything is working well. And here we go, you can see the flow of water coming through. And the flow of water here is significantly faster than even a, an Olympic athlete could pump out of that pump. Next. And here it is in action. Very nice flow of water. And when we get to just about the end of things, we end up at a school. And the school is one of the reasons why we're doing this project. And then David came up with the idea that what we really should do in case something doesn't happen or in case somebody is drawing out of the pipe too quickly, we need to have some kind of a reservoir there. And so we made arrangements to get this tank donated. And then he called back and said, okay, so now we need to build a foundation for the tank. And so we arranged for that. And uh, we'll continue on with the next photo. And here's the foundation the building that's in progress. And the next photo. And here is the tank in place. And you can see the water pipe coming up towards the top of the tank, which is the water going in, the pipe coming out of the bottom. And then it comes out the pitcock there so that the students at the school will be able to get water right there at school. And also will be available to the community people to come and fill up their jerry cans right in the community rather than going and pumping it from 2.5 kilometers away. Next. And here is the schoolmaster. He's out there celebrating the fact that uh, they now have water right there and uh, he's just doing an inspection. Next. And then also, because we got the three inch piping, there's room to branch off other directions. And so the NWSC is saying, okay, we can branch off and we can put out other pipes and we can take it directly into neighborhoods or into houses. And what we have to do though, in order to finance all that is we have to put a meter on it. So if you look at the little blue thing down there by the feet of the guy on the left, that's the meter. And so then they would charge them for that water to help recoup some of the expenses to, to do that. And next. I, can you bring up the map? Kathy did a really nice job of working with this map. Um, this is basically the country of Uganda. It's, it's a little bit bigger than what shows on the map, but, uh, but that is basically it. And I've highlighted a couple of different things. Here is Kampala, which is the capital. If you fly in there, you'll go to right here, and that's Entebbe. And then here is, um, this is um, the mountain which supplies all the water. And uh, the water runs down to this little red line or spot right there. And that is the city of Mbali. And then the second one right below it is where we're running the pipeline to 9.2 kilometers away. So it gives you a little bit of perspective as to what we're doing and, and how it's working. So it's uh, my expectation that we will have a celebration of this going on very quickly. And then eventually we can have uh, some photos of the celebration and, and hopefully they're gonna bring in uh, some media, um, some uh, legislative executives of some kind, and uh, also to all the workers and whatever. And so we've already sent them the money to, uh, and the club donated the money to sponsor that, uh, that celebration. So thank you for that. Well, it is a big congratulations to every one of the club members uh, because this is a project that you were behind. So wonderful. And then uh, extra special thank you to Lauren who really has been leading this project for a number of months and uh, generated not only his own generous time, but uh, resources as well. So we're so pleased to be a part of this. And uh, the way that we raise money in order to support this, I'd love to invite Jerry to come on up and tell us a little bit about the Taste of Rose Fest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's that time. So what are you doing on June 23rd? 
He's working. Tasting. You're working. Where are you working? <laughs> At the park. Well, some call it work. Actually, it's a lot of fun. So please get on your calendars. Maddie, hi, how are you? Um, sorry about that. Um, June 23rd, uh, we decided uh, with everything that's going on with COVID that we can go forward with this. And so we had the first meeting of the planning committee um, earlier in the month. Uh, things are starting. We'll do a more formal presentation about this, but I just need to get it on people's calendars. Everybody out there as well. June 23rd, get on your calendars, please. Oh, okay, look at the camera. No, they don't want to look at the camera. I'm all right. Okay. okay. Um, if there are people who are interested in helping out beforehand, um, we've got a great group that's always led with uh, the planning committee, and we could use a couple of people with that. We're looking for two specific skill sets, um, other than just liking to get together um, via um, Zoom on a Friday morning. We're looking for someone who has some PR background and also someone that's willing to work with Luke on sponsorships. Uh, we're going to contract again with um, Lori um, Polkovic, but she's got a new job. She's now working for the city of Oakdale and can't give us as much time. So she's willing to do kind of larger things. So um, also, if anybody's just interested in being part of that group, it's a fun group. Uh, they've been doing it for a number of years. They've got it down. Um, but we're always looking for more help with that. But aside from that, June 23rd is the date. And as you know, you will have a more formal presentation in a couple of weeks here. There's a lot that gets done before then with regards to tickets and um, uh, auction items and getting the word out. Um, but we're excited. This has been a long time since we've had one of these. So I see people's heads shaking yes for those who know what this is about. Um, you'll hear more from me. I'll just shut up now and sit down. Thank you for your enthusiasm and uh, leading the charge here and standing up today uh, to help us all get really excited about June 23rd. Yes. <laughs> <That's so good. laughs> all right. Uh, now I'd like to invite Jan to come on up and introduce our speaker for the day. I wish our speaker had had a chance to come and uh, be here in person, and I'm sure he wishes as well. But then I would have had a chance to pick his brain a little bit about some other parts of him. Uh, we, I have what you have seen, uh, which is that he has been hired as the first director of the Anderson County Housing Stability Department. But I would like to know a little bit more about the guy himself, and I don't. So I just have to tell you, I think we've got a speaker today that's going to give us as much valuable uh, information about an area that we have talked about a little bit, but not enough. And as Julie said, uh, is important to many people in our, our communities that we don't see. So with, with that, I would just like to, uh, but I first also would like to say that I want to thank uh, um, the former mayor of Roseville, uh, which I can't remember his name right now, uh, Clossy, Craig Clossy, uh, for uh, suggesting that we talk to the housing department and because uh, he has been uh, working on uh, housing for the last uh, several years since he retired. And with that, uh, Keith, uh, welcome to our, our club. Uh, we're glad to hear your message. Uh, look forward to it. And I hope that you have time for questions when we're done. And good afternoon. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so my name is Keith Lattimore. I'm the Director of Housing Stability with Ramsey County. Um, and to, you know, Madam President, as well as I see our, you know, one of our commissioners, Commissioner Mary Jo McGuire on the call, and fellow Rotary guests and friends, thank you for having me. Um, I want to just take a minute here to see if I can, I don't know if sharing my screen may disrupt uh, how we do this or not, but um, I had a couple of things I'd like, you know, just as we speak a little bit about homelessness in Ramsey County for you to kind of reference. So I'll, I'll try it here and if it doesn't work, then we'll just uh, speak on it. So let's just see if you can see my screen here. And if that's coming up okay, uh, we'll go ahead. Yes. Okay, thank you. So housing stability was established. Um, just last year, February 19th um, of 2021. Uh, prior to that, there was a lot of homelessness work being done really in siloed operations with Ramsey County. 
Um, we had areas like social services who would encounter individuals who were homeless. Uh, we also had financial assistance services, um, veteran services, corrections, and so forth and so on. And the way that it was being handled was really in siloed operations. And, you know, one would say, um, I'm working with the same individual as the other. So the county had been working for quite some time to see how can we look at the homelessness issue in Ramsey County and what makes sense really to, to pull those items together so we can somewhat address it from a centralized location. And so that's what, you know, um, so housing stability was, was started just last year, but the work has been happening um, prior to those years um, and even before the pandemic. So one of the things I wanted to kind of share is that, you know, so everyone can realize what is housing stability and who do we serve? Um, you would, some may know that we also have a, another department that I partner with, and that is our com commun uh, Community of Economic Development Department, CED is what we refer to it as an acronym. And this presentation here, this slide shows you that, um, Housing stability is really the demand. What do we need? How much of it we need? And what specific clientele are we serving? And that's where we look at the people. And you'll also notice the other part, the, the bottom part of this particular continuum slide is showing that Community of Economic Development Department is really that partner who I say, here's what we need and they go out and try to find it, build it or get the resources in order to invest in our community. So we have those ample supplies, that long-term supply chain of being able to house individuals in Ramsey County. As we look at some of the goals, um, it's like, well, what is housing stability and what are we out to do? What, what are some of those things that we wanna establish as housing stability? And as I mentioned before, you know, we want to align all the resources. That means funding, staffing, programs um, that are along the housing continuum. Um, we also wanted to aligning um, our housing efforts um, with economic competitiveness and inclusion vision planning. Uh, we want to reduce and eliminate racial disparities in housing and homelessness. And I'll just pause a minute on that particular bullet point. Um, because I have a couple of statistics here um, just for Ramsey County. Um, and homelessness in Ramsey County, American Indians are 14 and a half times more likely to be homeless than that of our white counterparts. And when we look at African American, they're 7.8 times more likely to be homeless in Ramsey County. And that's something that, you know, we, we have to, you know, be able to address. And so those are some of the goals that, you know, uh, for housing stability is like, how do we get equity within housing stability? And obviously, you know, probably some of you in the room may have many things that you may feel like are ways that we can do this. Um, but that's one of the ones that we specifically wanted to say as a goal of housing stability to reduce and eliminate those racial disparities that make up our homeless individuals in Ramsey County. Um, and our fourth bullet is really just serving as a collaborative partner with community members, planners, and other housing service providers. Ramsey County is not in this work to say that we know it all or, you know, or to do all of the work. We know that there's a, a host of partners in our communities, and we wanna be sure to be inclusive and in having them at the table in order to help guide us with this work. We are not the experts. And we also wanna make sure that we are partnering with those with lived experience, those individuals who's out there and telling us what works for them, not us telling them what should work. And that's one of the things and in, in, in the goals, just to give you a glimpse behind the department and things that we are leading as far as how do we get to from point A to point B. So building housing stability in our scope. Um, so where do we go? What are some of the things we need to focus on and how do we get there? So the first thing is like, we'd like to just be a place that just prevent homelessness in the first place. So those who might be on the cusp of perhaps being homeless, um, we wanna be able to have 
an eye on that as a department to say, how do we help our fellow citizens of Ramsey County address, especially when they are in, you know, close to being homeless? And how do we do prevention? What are some of the services we can provide? And how can we guide and send individuals to areas to help support them in their efforts to stay inside? We also wanted to you know, partner with our shelter outreach teams, those uh, individuals that are out there knocking on encampment doors, working with individuals, boots on the ground, uh, similar to the slides we just seen. Those individuals who are out there helping, those folks who are you know, uh, wanting to make sure that folks have a know-how of where these services are and have a, the ability to connect them with those services. Um, we also, you know, uh, look at our shelter operation and coordination. Those are coordinated with our current permanent shelter bodies that's within Ramsey County. And it's also working with those who are, you know, may have um, uh, other programs that couldn't support. We call them like our wraparound services. You know, you'll see that later on in, you know, in our next slide, you know, or, or uh, fellow other bullet, bullets or boxes here on this slide. But our wraparound services, how do we get those individuals connected to and you know the, the homeless individuals and, and how do we make sure that those partnerships are there? Uh, we need to have a coordinated entry placement in the housing. And that means that, you know, how do how do people get there? And is there, you know, do we just willy-nilly? Do we just let people go? We got to have some kind of coordinated system. So we have some understanding of those supplies and you know how to funnel people to the right areas. It makes no sense to point to an area and say this should work for you and not realize that perhaps maybe a family who might be homeless but need a shelter or need traditional uh, transitional housing. But if we place them in an area where their supports, maybe they're far away from their um, you know, religious services, maybe they're not close to their jobs, maybe they're not close to their support networks to help with babysitting and other things that people may consider as things that they need and you know, so we want to make sure that all of those things are coming together and we have the right information to direct people to the right locations. You know, and finally, you know, we got some housing referrals and some supportive housing uh, systems for individuals, families, and you. Um, and that's another thing. We like to make sure that, you know, um, those areas where individuals go, they have some kind of connection to say that this really is the right environment for me, not just housing, but is that environment right for me to maintain? What we try to avoid is that we want individuals to get to a place where they're comfortable so they will be highly encouraged to remain in that area and not come back to homelessness. So I want to talk about what the county has been doing, um, say, for the past couple of years. Uh, at the onset of the pandemic, uh, our current shelters that exist, I'm talking shelters like Catholic Charities, um, shelters like Union Gospel Mission and other partners, they were full and they were at capacity. But at the onset of the pandemic, they came to Ramsey County and said, in order for us to stay within the CDC guidelines, we're going to have to remove or eliminate half of our population so we can comply with social distancing. And so that's a problem. Because at the time, you know, we're figuring that if we got folks inside, at least in shelter, to move them outside really does not affect, you know, or, or, or does not make the, the, the problem better when we're talking about a pandemic. So the county stepped in and through um, federal funding, uh, we allocated dollars to set up what we call our county operated emergency shelter systems for singles and adults. Um, and you'll see here that we ended up standing up really six locations. I know five are on the screen, but one of them is actually our family shelter that we don't have a picture of here. But we set up six locations for seven different programs. And you'll see that, you know, we tried to coordinate so that, you know, we talk about putting people and giving them opportunities in the right places. We wanted to make sure like, for instance, our Mary Hall, we're typically around single men. You know, we had uh, Luther, shelter that was more around our uh, females and couples. And that was another population, you know, folks who were in encampments 
some of them have relationships. Some of them are husband and wife. Some are, you know, consider their family. And we wanted to make sure that they were able to come in and, and kill, uh, still keep that community connection um, with loved ones. So we did a, you know, a couples and women's shelter. Um, Bethesda shelter, uh, we set up uh, and partnered with M Health Fairview to set that up as a 100 bed shelter. But within there, we also had a 32 bed respite. So for those homeless individuals or those who might've been in shelter, if they contracted uh, COVID or had tested positive, in order to prevent the spread, we had an isolation location for them to come and receive nursing care until their you know, quarantine period was up. Um, and then of course we partnered with uh, Capitol Ridge where we looked at our population who were most vulnerable for COVID and these were our seniors. And of course we um, had a location for them to house them in an area as well. And then of course uh, Como, uh, we partnered with them to bring that, that place online for our overflow and those who might be moving through the continuum and who would be moving uh, next step would be possibly moving into their own apartment. So that was kind of what we called a step up program. So those who were most likely willing or able or along the continuum in order to move through the process to get back to being um, sheltered and having their own apartment. Oh, one thing, I'll, you know, before I go, uh, I do want to say that, you know, as funding runs out, um, you'll see down at the bottom that we did close some of these. And we closed some of these as some of our partners began to ramp up. So where you see we closed the Como shelter in September, that was through, you know, we looked at how many beds were being utilized versus how many actual people were in those beds. And so we made sure that, you know, we had ample space as we started to ramp down. And we also remember, or if you can remember, you also realize that these were one-time federal dollars that we received. So at some point the dollars are running out. So it was important for us to kind of maintain as long as we could in order to eventually ramp down. Uh, we talked about a family uh, approach and these are just some uh, areas here where we also partner uh, to take care of our families. And just to give you an idea, in Ramsey County, here are, it's kind of a, uh, I'm not sure how good this is showing on the screen there, but um, on this is really kind of the shelter types and where they're located in the county. Um, and so we just wanted to give you an idea of where are the shelters, where are they, you know, where are people, where are encampments, those things. But, but this is kind of where Ramsey County shelters are currently. So what happens when Ramsey County brought up you know, okay, let's stand up some shelters. What does that do? And how can you really look at this to see, well, what does that mean you stood up shelters? And if you look at this chart, it'll show you kind of a point in time, uh, several points in time through the course of uh, from October um, or actually um, from 2020, when we first started this response to our pandemic and how do we shelter and take care of our homeless brothers and sisters um, that are uh, in Ramsey County. So you look at from March, 2020 up until December, this just give you some, some ideas of what we were, uh, how it was affecting our community. The blue line indicates the camp uh, encampments. And it tell you how many people in Ramsey County um, were in encampments. And obviously, you know, it's gonna fluctuate a little bit because we know that not all everybody was counted, but to the best of our knowledge, we had the numbers from those outreach teams that were out there keeping track and finding out who was in encampments. And we'll see that somewhere, you know, July, 2020, uh, we were at our peak, you know, August, 2020, we were at our peak for those who were in encampments. And if you'll notice that was close to 400 individuals that were sleeping outside every night. But you'll see that on the onset of those response beds in Ramsey County, when we start bringing those online, you see that blue line starting to go back. And <clears throat> through our work, we were able to keep individuals inside through the course of this pandemic. Um, and that helped uh, reduce the spread. And it gave people some dignity around how uh, they were treated 
and how we responded as a community and as a county to make sure that our residents matter to us. This next map is courtesy of City of St. Paul. And <clears throat> this is a point in time uh, depiction of our encampments through the city. Um, say like from January 26, uh, they tracked 126 tents and 58 active sites with 154 individuals experiencing homelessness. And you'll notice that those green dots, those were green dots that uh, folks were able to come inside and the city was able to close those encampments because of the work that the, uh, the county did in order to partner up with the city. So they had a place for individuals to go. And you know the red dots were locations that were under assessment at the time. But this is just meant to give you a point in time. What does it mean? What is the work? Where are our tax dollars going? And this is the work that we were able to do um, with the partnership between Ramsey County and City of St. Paul where many of the shelters and encampments were. At the onset, we talked about race and ethnicity. Um, and I talked about, well, who is in the current shelters run by the county? And when we look at the race and ethnicity of those that are in emergency shelters, you will see that there are some, you know, our Black and African Americans are 42% of those 1,837 individuals served as of January 29th of this year. 36% of those were white, and you can see the rest, how it breaks down. So obviously there are things and very pointed in, you know, um, uh, you know, we talk about the racial disparities in this, we have to be able to address that and not um, walk with silence around this issue. And so it's, and that's why it's one of the goals of the department to reduce those disparities. So as we move forward, we have not only a, um, addressed the issue, but we also need to look systematically around what is causing this and what can we do as a community, as a department, and as a partners to address this issue in order to you know, move out, you know, move ahead. So that 1,837 individuals, um, where they come from? Who are they? Well, if you take a look at the chart, Ramsey County, those who originated in Ramsey County, they're part of Ramsey County citizens who live in Ramsey County, 763 of those, so about 42%. And if you look at the others, uh, you'll see that, you know, we have some who locations were unknown, but our biggest group, were those Minnesotans that were outside of Ramsey County. Um, you know, and if you combine, you know, the blue as well as the orange and the yellow, you'll see that somewhat 58% um, <coughs> of those individuals uh, that we serve are not from Ramsey County, but we chose to make sure that they matter to us. So we are serving those individuals. And I thought this is a very important uh, uh, pie chart to show when we give presentations, only because when you do something well, and this is not really, you know, there's obviously room to improve what we've done, but when you do something well, it attracts individuals from areas who probably don't have as much, or maybe the, the services were not as, as great. And so we attracted those individuals to Ramsey County, but we still serve them. Um, so this slide here talks about approximately 953 uh, people uh, at the point in time of November and just last year. We had 337 unfunded shelter beds as of May of this year. And then, you know, as we look at those beds coming offline, we're going to hit what we've been calling a cliff. Um, and we'll have 616 funded shelter beds available in May of 2022. And so if you look at that, technically, once the funding runs out, we will be in a position to where we don't have as much to address everyone being able to stay inside as our shelters ramp down.
When I talk about the other CED department um, and, and what does Ramsey County look like for housing? Um, we have 15, we are 15,000 units short in Ramsey County in order to uh, uh, get affordable housing for making that 30% area median, in, median income, or better yet, those below $22,500. And 11,000 of those are actually in the St. Paul city limits. So roughly another 4,000 from our rural or suburban Ramsey County cities. So what did Ramsey County do? Um, so when we got our American Rescue Plan Act dollars come in and our county board saw this information, there was a very specific um, purpose for them allocating roughly $20 million in our allocation out of 2021 and another $17 million in 2022 towards working to um, increase our affordable housing units, targeting that 30% area median income. And they targeted that you know, um, very specifically because we have a shortage of housing, affordable housing in Ramsey County. Um, the other thing that's not on here, but um, as a partnership, the city of St. Paul also received those uh, uh, American Rescue Plan dollars and they too partnering with Ramsey County we're able to collaborate roughly about $74 million that will be um, allocated to building affordable housing. And that's that partnership that I talked about earlier in the slides that say we're about the people and CED is about the infrastructure. And so that's going to be um, happening over the next three to five years. And we'll be building that infrastructure so we have a location for these individuals who are unsheltered um, to be able to have affordable housing. The one thing uh, down at the last bullet here on this slide, you talk about leveraging our HRA levy and for the first time Ramsey County um, has introduced an HRA levy that we believe will, I think is estimated for another $11 million that it will generate for uh, each year. And that will also be included with our CED department so we can build that infrastructure in Ramsey County mm -hmm. so we can you know, use those dollars as well. And those will be for years to come. For suburban Ramsey County, here's just a couple of slides, you know, um, uh, points here. Well, where does the funding, other funding uh, sources that we use? We use our block grant funding uh, for COVID, um, public services, infrastructure. Uh, we have home and home ARP, ARP dollars, marriage rescue plan dollars uh, for multifamily, new construction, uh, first, first home down payment assistance, um, countywide funding. We have our HRA levy that I just mentioned. Um, we also have our American Rescue Plan Act dollars um, that's invested on the previous slide. When we talk about a point in time, what does that look like today? Um, over here on this slide, uh, it's a little tough to read, so I apologize uh, for that, but I wanted to put something in and just say, where are we at right now? Tell me where we are. And where we are, uh, we're at, Roughly today, it was 283 individuals still in those um, temporary shelters that the county has stood up. And so we're trying to figure out how do we figure out ways to support those individuals through the next three to five years that it's gonna take for infrastructure to be built. And <clears throat> with that being said, one of the things that we are a part of is that we're a part of the Ramsey County Continuum of Care for the better, um, you know, for those who, lack of a better term, a brief explanation is it's a federal funded, HUD funded program that's backed by Ramsey County and other partners. And those individuals are um, at the table. Uh, it's not just Ramsey County, it is uh, several uh, organizations, folks with lived experience, our partners, our community. We have several um, elected officials that is on and, and a part of this. And it's really our way of collectively looking at Ramsey County and how we approach homelessness in Ramsey County. And we're aligning our department, housing stability is aligning the work with the recommendations that's coming out of this continuum of care. 
One of the things we ask this continuum of care to do is really break out a group and say, what and how do we address this moving forward with this 283 individuals? How do we continue to support going forward? And we need recommendations. And these, uh, our work groups came up with what we're calling the big four. And those are the big four ask. And if you look down um, the funding and what it would support, basically for the next three to five years in order to carry not even all of what is currently on, you know, what you show the 283, but if you could just cover most of that, here are the uh, areas that they came back and wanted to support. It felt like we still needed a hundred bed single room occupancy shelter for adults with integrated supportive services. That was the first one. The second was that we felt like we needed a low barrier pilot program serving frequent users of emergency shelters with intensive 24 hour staffing. And what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> what it means is that when we look at some of the highest users of emergency services, those that we're seeing in different parts of the department, those that are um, more frequent users, we're seeing that a lot of resources are really around roughly about 25 individuals. And since we are seeing them in corrections, we're seeing them in social services, we're seeing them in the emergency rooms, hospitals, and it's the pretty much the same 25 individuals, we wanted to carve out dollars specifically to address those individuals in need and higher needs and have a special program that we're calling a pilot um, to address those individuals. And we're calling that, you know, um, that pilot kind of our um, fam uh, familiar faces. The third um, recommendation that came out of our work group is that they wanted to continue the operation of a day service shelter providing supportive services for 175 individuals per day. And what that means is that we have a number of individuals who are in shelters, but we also know that there are some who choose not to come inside. And for whatever reason, um, we're looking at policies around how do we um, reduce those numbers so we have individuals willing to come inside and some may just only need day space. So for instance, some may work at night. We know that some shelters don't operate during the day. Some individuals are required to leave in the morning, but if you work at night, what do those individuals go and how do they have a place in the day so they can go and eat a meal, get a shower, get rest. And so we still wanted to support a day shelter. And then finally, we wanted to make sure that our family shelters that we're currently um, um, supporting don't go away. And these are services that, you know, for any person that may be sleeping in a car at night with a small child, or we've seen, you know, families uh, up to th two and three people sleeping under bridges. And these are um, individuals who many of us may think that are people that's really far away from us. But many of our homeless individuals are those who work. They just don't make enough to, you know, sustain um, housing. Um, and that's a barrier for them. Many of them have um, work jobs and many of them, you may go to your local restaurant and see uh, individuals who are actually working a job who could be homeless. So when in, in certain forms, we could say, look to your left and look to your right and see that somebody may be homeless. Um, that's just even in this room that we're in virtually. We wanna talk about what does that cost? These are costly programs. Um, and so uh, right now, when we look at um, the cost breakdown for a 100 bed single unit to be in place, um, you know, that's, that's $9 million per year. And you have a little bit of a breakdown of what it costs in order to support those services right here. Our day shelter will be a million dollars annually. Um, 100 bed family is $2 million. And the familiar faces model I spoke about is roughly about two and a half million dollars a year. Um, we have gained support. Uh, we actually have a bill that's been generated, and those bills are actually going making their way through our um, our, our legislation and uh, legislators. And we're hoping that we um, are able to be considered when we look at our um, nine plus billion dollar surplus for the state. These are things that we're hoping to be able to, to 
the fundings that we are able to secure so we can continue these operations that, and we're calling them kind of a gap operations of how do we fill the gap to keep folks inside and keep these programs viable, at least until we can have time to build that infrastructure. These are our governing board members of our continuum of care. Um, and you can see this is not just Ramsey County. These are folks who are from various organizations around our Twin Cities area, specifically in Ramsey County. And these are folks who do this every day. This is their job. These are boots on the ground, folks in the trenches. And we're happy to have them as part of our continuum of care in Ramsey County. And we also, also welcome anyone to come because it's not just our members. It is also those who just are interested in being, you know, attending the meetings, hearing what the issues are, understanding what we need from individuals and also participating. So I wanted to just also make a plug there that if any of you are ever uh, interested in attending those, those are open to the public and we welcome attendance um, in our continuum of care meetings. These are our governing board members. We also have steering uh, committee and those are the folks who have come up with these um, ideas around what do we need to move forward and how do we continue to do this work. And with that being said, um, I'll just see if there are any questions. I do have some resources uh, for some other slides, but just wanted to kind of just give you a glimpse of the work that the Housing Stability Department is tasked with doing. And, you know, I, I take back to, um, I think it was Julie, I believe that that led us in that prayer. Yes. I can tell you, um, I, I'm an old preacher's kid. And, you know, I think that the work that is just, what we do and how we do it matters. And I think that when we do it with the least of our brethren, I think that we're doing it, you know, obviously to move our work forward. So um, I'll pause there for a moment and see if there are questions. I do have some resources here as well as we flip through some different contacts for families as well. And we'll be, I can share this with um, perhaps uh, someone in the organization to forward some of our contacts if you believe that you have a need. Well, first of all, Keith, I just want to say thank you so much on behalf of our entire club for the work that you're doing. It's so very important and needed, and it's really making a difference. So we, we want to thank you for that. And we want to recognize you, as we do all of our speakers, with a contribution to Rotary Woods and Rain Garden in Central Park in the Roseville Arboretum. So we're really happy to do that on your behalf. Thank you. All right, so I see that Mary Jo has her hand up, so I'd like to call on her for, she has a question. Yeah, thanks so much. Can you hear me now? I'm having trouble yeah. with my mic, but you can hear me? Okay, great. Well, um, I just wanna say thanks so much to Keith Lattimore for just such a great presentation. You can tell how fortunate we are at Ramsey County to have have you Keith working on our, on our behalf for this great work uh, of housing stability. And just this, this huge effort, I just wanted to let people know that this huge ask that we have is really a statewide ask. I know Keith said that, but I'm highlighting the fact that we're going to the legislature, all hands on deck, asking for this money, since these are, of course, people from all over the state that we're serving. And so um, we're asking all of our, our local communities to support us. And the Ramsey County League of Local Governments is also supporting this effort. And so every city council person, mayor, school board member is getting a letter that that's um, asking them to help lobby our legislature on this. And I'm gonna ask all of you to, to talk to your legislators about this. This is an ask that we really need help with um, at the legislature. So just wanted to thank you, Keith, for all of your work and just to ask all of you to, to help out with this um, huge effort that we have to really serve those experiencing homelessness in our community. So thank you for that. All right, we have a, a question here as well, Jim. Yeah. Hi Keith, I'm back. <laughs> uh, what I, I heard was Ramsey County and you're working with uh, the broader communities there, but I'm also wondering about that elephant across the river. How uh, are you coordinating, or if you are, or how is Hennepin County uh, dovetailing with our efforts, or are we just getting all the Hennepin County people that are coming our way, or how does that go? Anyway, thanks. Well, I think there's ebbs and flows. I think that, you know, we do have a community that goes back and forth. Uh, again, these are individuals who have their social networks. And if their social networks move, then sometimes they follow. Uh, Hennepin County has their own continuum of care. 
And so they are approaching it as well. And the two organizations I meet often with the director of housing stability over there, just to kind of compare notes and see how to, you know, what are the trends and how do we move the work forward? But we do recognize that, you know, they're easy to say just twin city residents, but, you know, uh, we do. And that's why we cover each other. And I'm sure there's Ramsey County folks that go on their side as well. Absolutely. All right, we, we'll take one more question here from David. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, a question, you worked with uh, M Health, you said at Bethesda, have you talked to them at all about uh, St. Joseph's and what's right next to other existing close proximity to other services and uh, sounds like it'd be a good location to set up something there. And they can push on out there. Yes, we are. Um, and, you know, that's that's one of the locations I'm working closely with our property director, uh, property management director, uh, Gene Kruger, um, just to really find out where are other spaces that we might be able to support and sustain, um, you know, for this period of time that we're asking uh, the legislations, uh, our, our legislators to uh, fund those uh, those requests. Um, so yeah, we're we're looking broadly and we're looking far and near to really try to figure out where are some of those locations and how do we, you know, continue to house individuals as we move forward. Thank you so much. Again, we just really appreciate you being here today. And um, if if that information gets to us, we'll distribute it to the rest of the club members as well. So thank you so much. And I'd like to invite Jan back up. He's got two announcements. Um, I just wanted to remind you all that we have a share the love program going on right now where you get some extra credits for your contributions to the Rotary uh, International Foundation. And we are uh, doing very well in terms of heading to our club goals on our, our regular foundation. We need a few more uh, thoughts of people who might want to get uh, Polio Plus donation if they want to target to the Polio Plus. But, uh, that's through the end of March, if you make a contribution, that you get a matchup uh, of additional points towards your Paul Harris Fellows. Uh, so worthwhile to do that. If you haven't been a Paul Harris Fellow yet, uh, this is about to be the easiest time you ever have to get a chance to do that for the amount of money that you put in. Is the other thing I'm going to talk about next week? Yeah. yeah. Next week, we're going to have people from Anbetu Techa, which is the old Fairview Community Center, which is no longer in existence because this is the brand new building. They're going to come and talk to us about the adult high school program that's there and it's specifically about a community uh, event they might that they're working on in terms of a tiny shelter kind of uh, program. Anyway, thank you. Well, thank you all. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.